Hi, this is Wes Simpson with another edition of the Summer Sessions on Media Over IP, brought to you by Ames and the VSF. With me today is Chris Lapp, who is subject matter expert of IP routing from Diversify. And he is going to be talking about the differences between monolithic and spine leaf architectures. Welcome, Chris. Hey there, Wes. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? Not too bad. Just uh, enjoying another day of the summer. That's right. It looks like we're both in the tropics here, so what could be better? It's all good. All right, let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about monolithic or spine leaf and why, and the differences between the two different architectures and why it matters to you. So the most difficult part about designing any SMPTE 2110 project is designing your network. And this is for a couple of reasons. But before we get to those reasons, we have to understand the different architectures that are involved. Monolithic systems are similar to your broadcast SDI router. With this type of system, devices connect direct to one central network switch or device. This system is good because it helps you plan for now and the future, but it's limited. Your chassis can only be swapped out for certain sizes, and that can be difficult and costly. The configurations of these systems are also very simplified compared to the, their alternative. In a spine leaf system, which is more like your traditional cloud network architecture, um, there's higher resiliency to some failures. It allows for an east-west traffic flow. And by that, we mean visually traffic moves horizontally across the topology. It's almost infinitely scalable horizontally. Um, and when you build these systems, the most important thing that you need to do is maintain that they are non-blocking. There's also a couple different hybrid solutions that we use in media. And I like to refer to these as more of a hub spoke approach. And in these systems, you can use a combination of the two architectures to really help your endpoints get the best of the best for what they need to connect with. Audio nodes, which typically are one gigabit connections, would be senseless to connect to a spine, if the spine even supports one gig. So we typically like to put some kind of aggregation means on those types of devices. Other devices that are 10 and 25 gig connected may not be using the full throughput of that pipe. If they're only connecting for one monitor, for example, that's displaying a, a multi-viewer canvas, you wouldn't really want to use a 25 gig pipe for necessarily three gigs of bandwidth. Costing these systems out can be very difficult um, and price comparisons are usually required. Um, so this is a, a comparison of a system that I'm designing right now where there's three different architectures that are being considered, monolithic, spine leaf, and hybrid. And these are the rough cost estimates between the two. With a monolithic system being a single switch with multiple line cards, a spine leaf system being a fixed switch system with multiple leafs, and a hybrid solution that is a combination of the monolithic solution and certain leafs within the spine leaf architecture. And as you can see, the prices kind of are much higher for a spine leaf architecture to get the same throughput of bandwidth in that monolithic system, but the hybrid is kind of a halfway between. Chris, can you give us an idea of how many endpoints would be in a system like this? In this system, we're looking at roughly a couple hundred endpoints, um, and those endpoints vary in bandwidth uh, from a 10 gig interface to a 25 gig interface to some 40 and 100 gig interfaces. Gotcha, thank you. One term I mentioned earlier was non-blocking. Now, in the broadcast industry, most of us know this term as, in the baseband world, the ability to replicate any source to any combination of destinations. Switching any source to any of the destinations based upon signal type and format. In the IP world, this gets infinitely more complex. We classify this as the ability to route any source or packet to any destination port at any time with no restrictions. How is it done in IP? From a multicast perspective, simply ensuring you have enough bandwidth does not mean that you are non-blocking, and this is for a number of reasons. PIM and IGMP are not bandwidth aware. There is a chance that you can actually hash more bandwidth on a link than that link can fulfill, because in multicast, one megabit per second is actually treated the same as one gigabit per, or sorry, three gigabits per second in the hash algorithm. To fix this, we can leverage SDN to manage that bandwidth between links so that we can make sure that we're not oversubscribing. Now, which method is for you and why? Factors that most often impact this uh, in the network topology um, are below. Physical layout of your facility. If your switch is on one floor, 
and all your endpoints are on another floor, it may not make sense to direct run fiber all the way from your central equipment room down 20 floors. Bandwidth requirements. Um, if you have a device that is 100 gigs and you are only uplinking with 100 gig interfaces to your leaf switches, it may not make sense to direct connect a 100 gig device to that leaf switch instead of just bring it back to the spine. That way you're not wasting an entire uplink. The device connection types play into that. If you have one gig, your spine switch may not support one gig interfaces. If you have 10 or 25, 40 or 100, you need to select your spine switch based on those interface types as well. The network size. If you have a small uh, event, um, typically stadiums, it may not make sense for spine leaf architectures to be used because there's only a select number of devices. Versus if you're in a large facility, you may need to scale that network architecture out to support multiple functions. Switch selection. Certain manufacturers of switches have certain types of switches to be used. Um, obviously, as we are advancing in technology with 400 gig and 800 gig, uh, more switches will become available and that will definitely change which switches we use in these architectures. And function. This one is kind of hard to define at first, but once you start looking at your facility, you may decide that your master control and your production control need to live on two totally diverse systems. So it may make sense to have a spine switch and then these other functions going through different leafs. Now, in conclusion, there's really no right answer. There's no one size fits all solution. Designs each have their own place. Um, and you really need to do a discovery process to find the right solution during the design and development. And the biggest, most important thing that I tell my customers is you should never design your network before you know what's connecting to it. This is kind of derailed projects in the past where they have a network switch, they purchase the network switches, they're on site, and then they buy devices and those devices don't have the right interfaces to connect to this network. And so tagline phrase of myself is gone are the days of design the network and they will come. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, so let, let's um, dig into this a little bit. First of all, it, it sounds like there's, you know, three different architectures that, that you look at, the, the totally monolithic, the fully spine leaf, and then the, the hybrid that you mentioned. So which one do you see most of your potential clients leaning towards nowadays? Right now, most of our potential clients are leaning towards monolithic because they're not really doing anything that requires a spine leaf architecture or their bandwidth requirements are so low that everything kind of fits on one switch with over 20% for expansion. Now, as we move more towards those UHD workflows that people are looking at, those systems are now trying to look towards spine leaf in 400 gig because you get that more throughput, more bandwidth, more scalability for the UHD. Mm -hmm. do, do most of your clients have an audio island somewhere? Yes, almost every single client has some kind of audio island. Um, and that is really to facilitate those endpoints like audio consoles or stage boxes or even as typical as a strict audio monitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those all have pretty low bandwidth uh, interfaces typically? Typically, yes. Yeah, well, I guess you can get a lot of uh, audios on a one gig pipe, huh? Yeah, it's uh, it's quite insane how many audios you can fit across a 10 gig pipe. I mean, we almost wish we could have larger switches for audio when we're pumping up those pipes. More, more, uh, more connectives, more connections. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, so what are the steps for designing a uh, an IP network? You know, you mentioned that you shouldn't do that up front. What is the right time in in the process uh, to really get to the point where you know which kind of architecture you should be looking at. Yeah, so the, the way I always like to go about things is build up a spreadsheet that has all of your devices on it. And once you know all of your devices and define their connectivity, whether that be one gig, 10 gig, could even get as stringent as single mode versus multi-mode, um, you then, once you have that, have to decide, okay, where do I want these located? Once you decide where they're located, you can then start to define your network. So if they're all centrally located in a CER or very close to a CER, you can start to look at the monolithic design and say, okay, if everything's connecting here and I need X amount of expansion, this switch will fit my needs. Or if you start to get to a, a possibility of, okay, I'm four kilometers apart in my network, I need to deploy some kind of spine leaf to make that work because I don't want to put 55 strands of fiber or 100 strands of fiber between these two facilities. Um, 
then you can start to design that way. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really once you have your devices, your locations, and your connectivity requirements defined, then you can start to look at the network. And once you start to look at the network, it's not about port count. You could have two devices on a leaf switch and be completely full mm -hmm. because it's you have to start looking at senders and receivers. The most important thing to remember is that all of your senders on your switch must be able to get to the spine at all times. And all of your receivers on the switch must be able to be serviced from the spine at all times. Yeah, so if you have a big multi-viewer, that could chew up just a port or two, but a whole lot of the uh, the backbone capacity. That's correct, right. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So so talking about managing that backbone ca capacity, you know, the, the, the connection between the... Um, the spine and, and the different leaves. You know, most customers today are using broadcast controllers uh, to do that, that, that are aware. What's your experience? Where do we stand in terms of the maturity of those broadcast controllers? And are they able to dynamically switch the videos in real time for a, for a modern broadcast facility? Yeah, so the maturity is really getting there. Um, and, you know, the, the different broadcast controllers, they all have different approaches to how they're doing this. Um, some are using third-party applications provided by the switch manufacturers. Some are using APIs. Some are using open config to do this bandwidth management. And the, the development is really getting to the point where we can actually very much rely on those broadcast controllers to do that switching. And it's actually allowing us to use more of the piped bandwidth between the switches because since we no longer have to rely on the hash algorithm, then we can actually use more of the bandwidth. Oh, so so it gives you more granular control, and and, and, it, and it really knows the difference between those one megabit and three gigabit flows, huh? That's correct, yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Well, Chris, this has been really informative, and thanks for your time today. I hope everything, um, hope everything goes well. Thanks, Wes. Hope you have a great day. You too. And um, I, I, I guess you're uh, getting ready to join the ranks of fatherhood here. Yeah, this is actually child number two. It's about to be born any day now. Um, we're actually on standby to go to the hospital right now. Well, I, I really appreciate you being able to, to take some time. And, and thanks to you and thanks to uh, your wife for giving giving us all permission to record this today. Thank you so much. No problem. Thanks a lot, Wes. All right. Hope everything goes well. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.